so good to see you all tonight. Welcome. Thanks so much for uh, for coming. We've had many uh, wonderful guests here at this series, but I'm especially happy tonight to welcome uh, a man whom I admired and cheered on from afar <laughs> for years, and I've had the pleasure since he's uh, relocated part-time in Washington at the Center for American Progress uh, to get to know and love as a, as a friend. So, Bishop, welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, again, the book, God Believes in Love, it's a wonderful, wonderful book, uh, and um, I, the bishop will be glad to sign any copies of those of you who want to purchase a copy. Uh, it always I, makes me nervous when somebody's actually read the book. Yeah, right. Before they, <laughs> before they ask me questions. I'm thinking, what did I say about and I, I said this morning, I had a guest on the show, Norm Ornstein, who was one of our speakers, and I said about Norm's book, this is a must read, and Norm said, no, it's a must buy. <laughs> so, so. Spoken like any author, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, Bishop, I'd like to start, everybody knows sort of the end of the story. You were the first openly gay, consecrated bishop of a major Christian denomination. Not so many people know the beginning of your story. Uh, not, it's pretty humble beginnings in Kentucky. Tell us about that and um, how you ended up in the ministry. Yeah. I, um, well, look at, you just never know who's going to walk in. <laughs> An old friend from New Hampshire died in the wool Episcopalian. Welcome. <laughs> um, They're following you around. That's right, just to make sure I'm uh, telling the truth. Um, yeah, my parents were uh, tobacco sharecroppers in uh, Kentucky, which is about as close to slavery as white folk have come in this country. Um, uh, I didn't live in a house with running water till I was 10. Um, and uh, church was the center of our life. Although, um, actually, I, to go really far back, I wasn't expected to live. Um, I weighed 10 pounds at birth. So all the women in the audience are squirming. <laughs> My mother was this tiny little woman, and um, uh, several doctors tried to deliver me uh, unsuccessfully, and my mom had the, the next to the rarest kind of blood, and they didn't have any. This is 1947. And uh, so they couldn't do a C-section, and ultimately I was uh, uh, delivered, and um, and they came out and told my dad that, um, that my mom was probably going to die and that I definitely was. And so they needed a name for the birth and death certificates for me. And uh, so it's how I got my, my first name is Vicky. Just think about that for a minute. Uh, and I lived in the South where they call you both names. So I grew up as Vicky Jean. <laughs> which was the name that my parents had picked out for a girl, my, my dad's name being Victor, my mother's name being Imogene. So they had picked out this name, and he figured that it wouldn't matter on my death certificate and on a gravestone. So he just changed the spelling to V-I-C-K-Y-G-E-N-E. -E. Um, I was paralyzed completely on my right side. My head was totally crushed in, and... Um, and uh, so I was in an incubator for a month. They gave me to my parents who had no resources to do anything for me. And, and they just said, he'll, he'll never walk or talk or have any kind of mind. <laughs> Some people still think that <laughs> that actually came true. Uh, and, uh, but, but he won't live very long anyway, so it's okay. And so they just took me home and loved me. And by the time I went into the first grade, I was reading at fourth grade level. And um, when I was, th this is way more information than anybody <laughs> needs to know, but when I was uh, 13, I think, uh, my pediatrician, whom I just adored, I, I grew up wanting to be a pediatrician because of him, sat me down and said, uh, he had always said when I came in for an appointment, you sure look better than the first time I saw you, because he was, he was the one who actually delivered me. And second of all, uh, I had help from above when I delivered you. At 13, he sat me down and he said, I'm going to tell you something that no one else in the world knows. Not your parents, nobody. He said, I was absolutely convinced you were going to die. And all I could think about was your 20-year-old mother looking at your 
little corpse in a coffin with your head all crushed in. He said, you looked like a monster. And to save her that trauma, he said, I, I took my hands and mushed your head back into as round a shape as possible. He said, it just, it horrifies me to tell you this because had I had any idea that you were gonna live, I would never have done such a thing. But I just couldn't bear the thought of your mother seeing you uh, all crushed in your little coffin. And um, he said, I just, I just think you ought to know that. And that's why um, I keep saying to you, I had help from above when I delivered you. Mm. So um, that, that's really going way back. Uh, I, so I grew up in the, in the Disciples of Christ Church, a, a fairly fundamentalist. I just uh, must say, when I asked that question, I didn't, you didn't know I'd go that far that back. Answer. <laughs> Have I never told you that before? No. Really? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I'm I know. Stunned. And I think he did a pretty nice job, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> All things considered. Um, grew up in the Disciples of Christ Church. Um, uh, you know, um, as is true with, with people with a lot of resources. I mean, church was our whole life. And uh, I think I had 13 years of, of uh, perfect attendance at Sunday school. I had all the little bars. You know, it's like not quite the military, but, you know, all the bars hanging down. Um, but by the time I got to the end of high school, I was really um, not happy with the kind of narrow um, view that they took. And, and the, the question that, that, that I could not understand and kept asking was, so God is love, but everyone who doesn't believe in Jesus is going to burn in hell. How do I put that, those two things together? And uh, so what, what I was told was that there were certain questions I shouldn't ask. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me at the, at the ripe old age of, I don't know, 17, that there might be questions that didn't have easy answers, but there was no question that shouldn't be asked. So by the time I went off to college, I, I was pretty fed up. And I, um, for financial uh, full scholarship reasons, uh, and academic ones, I went to the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, and which is owned by the Southern Dioceses of the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Never been in an Episcopal Church in my life. So, uh, because now I was 18 and I really did know everything there was to know, uh, I was spouting off about, you know, all my problems with religion and all of that, and the assistant chaplain there said, those are great questions already a difference, right? Those are great questions. Um, I'm not sure I have the answers, but why don't you come in and, and we'll look for those answers together. And I thought, okay then. And then I would rant and rave about the Nicene Creed and how I didn't believe most of that stuff. And he would say, well, just drop out uh, from those places that, you know, you get to a phrase that you don't believe, just, just be silent during that part. And I thought, okay, well, I can, I can do that. <laughs> And, uh, and pretty soon I was, uh, you know, swallowing the whole thing hook, line, and sinker and um, uh, diverted from my pre-med uh, education and uh, went to seminary. Right. In the seminary. Then, uh, was it in the seminary that you met your wife? You were married yeah, and I was, had two children. Uh, right. I was in uh, therapy for two years to cure myself of this awful thing that uh, I feared was true about me, which is that I was attracted to men and not women. Uh, God, I'd love to have that money back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I ever see that therapist again... <laughs> Um, but, uh, to his credit, I guess, he did what I asked him to do, which was to get me to a place to have a relationship with a woman, I loved children, wanted a family, and so on. So I met uh, Boo and um, told her within two weeks of meeting her that all my relationships had been with men, and, but that I'd been in therapy, thought I was ready for that, and uh, about a month before we were married, uh, broke down in tears one night and said, I'm just so fearful this ugly thing is going to rear its ugly head at some point. And she said, well, if that happens, um, I think we love each other enough that, that we can deal with it. And 13 years and two children later, uh, we did. And 
uh, we actually went back to church to end our marriage, um, as opposed to sort of just sort of slinking away in the in the night. Uh, we were doing this for each other, um, and so we took a priest with us to the to the um, judge's chambers for the final divorce decree, and then went to church, and in the context of the communion service, asked each other's forgiveness for any ways that we might have hurt one another. We pledged ourselves to the joint raising of our children, um, cried a lot, um, and gave each other our wedding rings back, because the wedding ring is the symbol of the vows, and those were vows that we no longer held each other to. And, and then had communion together. It was just one of the most healing moments of my whole life. And uh, I will forever be grateful to her. Uh, we're, we're still great friends. No regrets from that? No, no, I, you know, I mean, p p p part of the regret question is, uh, it would be uh, imagining life without my two daughters and now my two granddaughters. Um, and, uh, and my wife was one of my presenters at my consecration as a bishop. So um, uh, it's pretty, uh, a great blessing. How long have you been with Mark Andrew? It'll be 26 years, uh, November 6th. Wow, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty and amazing. you were um, united in a civil union at first, correct? Oh my God, we've got so many anniversaries, right? <laughs> uh, this That's is, what I thought. This right? is really yeah. true of a lot of gay couples because, you know, As, if you always had marriage, then that was, that's the day. Well, you know, we've got the day, the day we met, the day he moved to New Hampshire. Then we had our house blessing uh, in 1989, which was as close to a, a service of blessing as we could, could do without getting my bishop in trouble. And, um, and then in 2008, we had a civil union when that became legal. And then uh, 2010, uh, marriage equality uh, became the law in New Hampshire and we were married. So I've got an anniversary in almost every month <laughs> <laughs> of one kind or another. Now your book, in your book, one of the things that I love about, we've talked about it before is you, you go through all the arguments that we hear, all of us here, against marriage equality and against it, and you knock every one of them down, right? Well, I but try. First, yeah, let me ask you, first of all, are you surprised at how fast this issue has moved? I mean, in 2004, there were 11 ballots in states to, to make same-sex marriage unconstitutional. Every one of them passed. Right. And now, DOMA has been declared unconstitutional. The President of the United States supports same-sex marriage. There are 13 states now where marriage equality exists, plus the District of Columbia. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, we have never seen this kind of progress in this amount of short time um, uh, uh, around any civil rights issue. But, but you have to understand that, that this began and, 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 is, and we are where we are for one main reason, and that is so many of us have come out. 20 years ago, most people would have told you they didn't know anyone gay. Well, they might have worried or been talking behind Uncle Harold's back at, at Thanksgiving dinner about, uh, um, you know, he, he did seem a little odd. Uh, or they would say, oh, those two ladies who live down at the end of the street, we love them. They keep their yard so nice, you know. But what, what they would have meant was that they didn't know anyone who would uh, openly and proudly tell you they were gay. And now, um, is there a family left in America that doesn't know some family member, some co-worker, some next door neighbor, or former classmate, right? You go, go, go back to your class reunions and, and sometimes your good old buddy Jack is now Jackie. So, uh, and that's made all the difference. I mean, Harvey Milk got this really right. He, Harvey Milk said, um, coming out is the most political thing you can do. <laughs> he went on to say, because when they know us, they'll love us. <laughs> well, m most of us anyway. But, but that's, that's why. So in some sense, this started a lot longer before and and oddly enough the one shining light in the AIDS epidemic was that um, many many people 
were forced to come out because you couldn't go home to mom and dad with those big red blotches and, and be on your deathbed without coming out. And so it, it really um, crystallized uh, that for so, so many people in the culture. And now, when you talk about the issue, a face comes up or a relationship. You know, you know a gay couple or a lesbian couple. And, and, and now people are unwilling to think and say the things that they used to say and think because now they know someone and they know those things not to be true. And so, uh, and yet still in the early 2000s, we got all of those um, constitutional amendments uh, uh, defining marriage between a man and a woman. And now, I don't think any of them would pass now, mm -hmm. but they passed in the early part of the last decade. And, and now in order to, uh, to get beyond the states that we've gotten, which didn't have these amendments, uh, we have to first overturn the amendment and then propose marriage 32, 32 states with those amendments. Yeah. That's, that's, it's, that's going to be tough. It, it's huge. Yeah. And, and last year when Maine, uh, Maryland, and Washington, uh, and in some ways Minnesota, uh, uh, passed marriage equality, um, it, was the, it was the first time that we'd won at the ballot box. The other side had always said, yeah, well, yeah, but it's never won uh, when you put it up to a vote. Uh, they can't say that anymore. So let me ask you the questions that you ask in the book, just uh, and, and briefly uh, talk about each one. The first question is, why should straight people care about gay marriage? Well, they shouldn't, uh, un unless they care about the kind of society they're in. I mean, uh, especially if you're white, male, and straight, uh, you shouldn't care uh, about racism, sexism, or or heterosexism unless you care about the kind of society you live in, right? And if you do care, then you, you go and you march with Dr. King in, in Selma uh, on behalf of African Americans because you realize that racism, um, that white people pay a price for racism too, and you want to live in a culture that, that recognizes uh, people of color. Um, and, and, and you're a feminist because you believe that men and women are equal and until they're equal, you have to fight against that. And so um, I, I think straight people need to care about this because, uh, because it matters what kind of a culture we live in and uh, whether in fact when we say uh, liberty and justice for all, whether it means all or whether there is a spoken or unspoken asterisk referring you to some small print at the bottom of the page uh, outlining uh, who's not included in all. But if you believe in liberty and justice for all, then it seems to me that, that we have to be on, on these sides of things. And again, questions that you ask in the book, don't think I'm being impertinent here, but <laughs> so why aren't you just satisfied with civil union? So, um, Why do you, need you, you, you get a call uh, from the state police saying that your partner uh, has been in a terrible accident and is in the emergency room of St. Swithin's by the gas pump hospital. And, and you rush there and they tell you that, I'm sorry, you're not family. You're not immediate family. That's not the time to start teaching the nursing staff what the rights are for civil unions. Because your partner is bleeding to death in, in the emergency room. If you can walk in and say, he's my husband, um, you get shown right back to the room. Uh, everybody knows what marriage is. Uh, even the people who work on civil unions hardly know what civil unions are and what they aren't. New Jersey is a, a terrific example of a place that, that has civil unions and it's just not going well at all. And at the end of the day, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you know, maybe it's a duck. <laughs> if, if what we are seeing gay couples do with themselves, with their relationships, with their lives, with their children, uh, if it looks like marriage, then let's call it what it is. Um, and, and, and this 
in addition to being about the law, is about respect. And we respect marriage. It's the way that society um, ensures that society's um, stake in the stability of the culture. A long time ago, we realized that, that marriage was the, the one institution that, that more than any other um, uh, undergirds the stability of a society, that the kinds of commitments people make to one another in marriage are the very kinds of things that, that make for a good and stable society. And so this is, until we have marriage, uh, we simply are not equal. And um, it, it's, it's more than just a word. If it, if it were just a word, then we could do what I think we actually sh should have done from the very beginning, which is let everybody have civil unions. And then for those who want to go to a place of worship and engage in holy matrimony, then you know, we could call that marriage press. But you can't, you, you can't undo that, right? Um, France gets that right. Everyone gets married at the mayor's office in France. And then people of faith go to their place of worship for whatever kind of blessing that that, that, um, that particular faith might, um, might uh, provide. Uh, but we can't undo that in this country. And, and so it seems to me that the only way to, to do this is, uh, is marriage. Uh -uh. Think of your questions and hold your questions, and we'll get to you uh, shortly here. But the, finally, in the book, um, well, this week, it was last week, we saw on the floor of the House of Representatives um, members of Congress arguing against food stamps, arguing in favor of cutting food stamps, quoting the Bible. Um, right. There are so many people who quote the Bible to say that homosexuality is still wrong. Leviticus, Romans, Timothy, you, you can name them all. What did Jesus say about homosexuality? What do you do when you meet these people who quote the Bible to you? I'm giving you what Jesus said about the Bible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, about, about homosexuality. homosexuality. Right. Um, or the Bible. <laughs> or the Bible, right, right, exactly. Well, he had his own Bible. He, was, he, uh, he, he knew the Hebrew Scriptures backwards and forwards. Um, so, uh, so this is about a two-day seminar. Yeah. But let me give you the Cliff's Notes. For, do they still even have Cliff's Notes? I don't know. I hope we so. know what they it's, are. It's, Anyhow. it's what online. online right. yeah. It's what got me through college. But anyway, um, quick story. So it's all about context, right? And you can't take a, uh, a, uh, a text, no matter how sacred, uh, that was written over a period of a thousand years by many different authors uh, in many different situations and attempt to understand what any uh, portion of it means without understanding the context in which it was written. And here's, here's, here's the illustration. Suppose it's the year 3000 and the game of baseball has been lost. Nobody plays it, nobody knows the rules, nobody knows anything about baseball. And in the year 3000 you pick up a, a book, a novel that was written in the year 2000 and one of the characters is described as being out in left field in the year 3000, you would assume you knew what that meant because you know what left is and you know what a field is. But unless you know the game of baseball and that most people bat right-handed and the left fielder um, uh, backs up to catch the fly balls and that it's become a metaphor for being out of touch, out of the loop, isolated and so on, you would completely miss the meaning. So in the year 3000, you would think you knew what those words meant because you would be using modern day understandings of them without understanding the context at all of, of where it came from. We have to do the same thing with, with scripture. And the short answer is, when you do that with scripture, when you consider the context, um, none of those seven, and there are only seven passages that even purport to relate to this issue, uh, none of those uh, say uh, answer any of the questions we're asking today. And, and I'm going to say something here that, that you will find uh, unbelievable, but homosexuality did not exist in ancient times. That is to say, in ancient times, same-sex behavior was known. 
but an understanding of, of homosexuality had not even been thought of yet. Everyone was presumed to be heterosexual. And so to be acting in a same-sex manner was to be against one's nature. Not until the late 19th century did someone first posit the notion that a small percentage of us would be born oriented towards people of the same gender rather than the opposite gender. And so homosexuality was born as was heterosexuality. Because if it's the only, if it's the only thing, then you don't have to name it, right? But when something that contrasts to it gets named, then all of a sudden both are created. So the, the notion of sexual orientation is only about 140 years old. So you can't take a modern day concept like homosexuality and plug it back into a two or 3,000 year old text without doing violence to that text. It would be like expecting Moses to know that the earth was round <laughs> rather than flat. Uh, we wouldn't expect that of him. Well, neither can we expect the uh, scriptural authors to understand homosexuality as we understand it today. That's, that's the core of a two-day seminar. <laughs> Bravo, right? Now, I just can't resist one more. By the way, so, and the quick okay. phrase is, yeah. I believe that the Bible is the word of God, but not the words of God. And that's the great divide that we have in religions right now uh, between those who, who believe that, that God uh, indeed dictated those words and meant every one of them. Although, you know what? So here's a really funny thing. Uh, they, would, they would say to you that God said everything God had to say to us, you know, in Scripture. Which implies that God stopped talking to us at the end of the first century when we decided which books would go in the Bible. <laughs> which is a, 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 like what? Did he say, you know, uh, good luck with that. Hope it goes well for you. Uh, I'm off to, I don't know, the Bahamas. You know? I actually believe in a, a living God that continues to reveal uh, to us. In fact, Jesus said on, uh, at the Last Supper, he says to his disciples, there is much that I would teach you, but you cannot bear it right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. Surely it was the Holy Spirit that led us into the truth of African American slaves being full and equal humans. Surely uh, it is the Holy Spirit that, that teaches us that men and women are equal. And the big question right now is, is God also teaching us that gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender people uh, also should have full and equal respect um, and full and equal citizenship? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, so I can't resist. I have to ask you interdenominational question, I guess, but what do you think of Pope Francis? Boy, he's shaking stuff up, isn't he? He is. Um, so I am guardedly uh, optimistic. Uh, his first interview back, uh, coming back from Brazil was, was his toe in the water. And, and uh, it was a very welcome change in tone. And I, th I think the, the, the people who most benefited from his, those words were gay priests, uh, because uh, the last two popes have tied together homosexuality and pedophilia. And they were gonna solve their, their uh, child abuse problem by ridding the priesthood and their seminaries of, of, uh, of gay men, which is, just does violence to all of us. Uh, that, that theory, that notion has been thoroughly and completely debunked, and yet the Vatican kept putting it out. So he, in, in his first statements, he seemed to be uh, pulling that apart. And, and what I he think said, that, who great. am I to judge, was his... Well, so uh, I wrote a, a, a full-page commentary for Time Magazine on, on these statements, and, and I said, it's an, isn't it an indictment of Christianity that when a Christian never mind the Pope, says, who am I to judge that it makes news? 
<laughs> I mean, after all, it is one of the main teachings of Jesus, and so why should it be news? And yet, yet it was big news. Yeah. Now yeah. these these latest uh, statements are even even more uh, tantalizing and profound and and positive and going in the right direction and the right attitude. However. Let's notice that in Australia, uh, they just uh, defrocked a priest for his verbal um, uh, support of gay marriage. Uh, I mean, so let's be really happy that it has, uh, that it, the tone seems to be changing. Let's see what else, if anything, changes. So I'm, I'm taking a wait and see, be optimistic, and be very positive about so far so good. But let me tell you, um, Roman Catholic LGBT people have been living in a parched desert for a very long time. And what this is, is a sprinkle. <laughs> but what they need is, is a downpour. And so let's pray for more rain. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Bishop Robinson. We have had a wonderful conversation so far. I invite you to join it uh, if any of you have any questions for the bishop. Yeah, Craig, and then. Oh, oh, sorry, microphone coming. You know, while we're waiting for that, I have to tell you, uh, some of you know I spent 10 years in the, pre in the seminary studying for the priesthood, and I keep looking at the bishop and thinking, maybe if I had stayed in the seminary, I might have become a bishop and I could wear that purple. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the clothes. You have to wear. <laughs> We have to wear all this drab I it, stuff. I mean, I do know, it for the bling. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. I like it. <laughs> you look lovely. Thank you. And so do you, may I say. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just as an aside, my family is from South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. And all wow. of my uncles went to Swanee. So I know how lonely it Yay, is. Yay, Swanee's that right. Exactly. <laughs> it's 10,000 acres on top of a mountain near nothing but Pittsburgh, perhaps. We were, uh, uh, we were just thrilled, my partner and I, uh, with your ordination as bishop. And somewhat surprised at the reaction, although wasn't the reality that only four of the dioceses of the more than 100 dioceses really pulled out of the church? Or is that incorrect? So uh, if you just looked at the headlines, you'd think there had been this big 50-50 split, right? Right. So we have about 117 dioceses in the Episcopal Church, uh, four of them, three of which were the only three left that had not ordained women, right? Which, if somebody wants to talk about the connections between homophobia and misogyny, we can, we can do that. Um, their bishops tried to take the diocese out of the Episcopal Church. You can't do that. The diocese is a creation of the general convention of the Episcopal Church. So bishops can leave, and parishioners can leave, and priests can leave, but a diocese can't leave. So um, they did leave. And that is to say those bishops and some priests and so on. Uh, but those dioceses continue uh, as Episcopal um, dioceses. And in fact, uh, two or three of them have ordained gay clergy. Really? Uh-huh. And women. And it's like a whole new world for them. Uh, if you use their numbers, um, they only claim to have drawn about 100,000 people away from the Episcopal Church, which is a little over 2 million. So, uh, yes, it's sad that they left. Um, one has to wonder if they were really Episcopalians. They're calling themselves Anglican churches, but you're not Anglican if you have no official connection to the Archbishop of Canterbury, which they don't. So it's a bit of a misnomer that... Um, um, and, and, and they'd be welcome back any time mm. of day or night. And indeed, many of the people who were very concerned over this uh, have come back. Uh, in my own diocese, we had very few that left. I mean, after all, I was elected by, by my diocese to be their bishop. So in, in, in one sense, m my diocese had the least controversy of any diocese in the church. Um, we're seeing um, uh, lots, lots of people coming back because 
in the decade that I was a bishop, we had all this change coming about, right? And some of the bishops that, that were adamantly opposed to my consent to, to becoming a bishop and got outvoted and so on, stayed in the church, are, are now permitting same-sex uh, same blessings in their diocese. I just, West Virginia, uh, the bishop over there has just been really staunchly on the other side. I just pick up a thing the other day saying that they're uh, starting to bless same-sex unions in that diocese. It's, it's just an astounding thing. Were you at all surprised at the reaction uh, of those four dioceses that it was so no, strong? No, no, no. Uh, and really, this goes really goes back to 1976 when we started ordaining women. Those dioceses were never. In fact, it's splitting that that breakaway church. So Pittsburgh uh, ordained women, and these other three that didn't all broke away together, and now they're fighting over the ordination of women. Mm. Hmm. Because some of them want to continue not ordaining women, which makes the women priests who left with Pittsburgh uh, feel a little on the second class side. And that's the thing about schism. Once it becomes the way you solve something, it never ends. You just keep dividing over one issue or another until there's nobody left but yourself. <laughs> nobody left to disagree with. Which is why the, the church, universal, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, the, the, the church since the first century has always said that schism is worse than heresy. Yeah, please. It's an honor to be here tonight. Um, given recent legislation in the Russian Federation, anti-gay legislation, there's a lot being written and talked about yeah, action against the uh, Winter Olympics in 14. What are your thoughts on how the world should react to that? Yeah, um, so, you know, I think our experience when we boycotted the Olympics before was that it was a, a tragedy for our athletes. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not much in favor of any kind of a boycott. Uh, you know, you've got some kid who's been going to swim practice since he was three. Uh, it just seems, cruel to, to pull the rug out from under him or her. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think uh, it's, uh, it's another thing for uh, entertainers to refuse to perform or, uh, you know, s s similar things like that. Um, so this international thing is, 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 is so complicated, right? I mean, you've got the Kill the Gays Bill law in Uganda which, by the way, has been completely stoked. Those fires have been stoked by uh, conservative uh, uh, Christians from America. Uh, we have been exporting homophobia there. Um, and, and their context is different because, like I said before, what, what has made a difference here is how many of us have come out. Well, 80 plus countries still criminalize homosexuality and in five or six of them, you can be put to death for it. So you're just not going to get the numbers of people standing up and, and coming out. And until enough people do, you don't get this kind of, of, of change that we've seen here in our own country. I mean, I was uh, in England at the last Lambeth Conference and, and talked to young, uh, with a young uh, lesbian uh, from Uganda. When she came out to her parents, her parents took her to the local police station where she was raped by every policeman at that station to cure her of this. I mean, so you get that kind of thing happening, and you're just not going to get people uh, standing up and saying, yeah, I'm gay too. And until that happens, um, not a lot's going to change. Um, but it's really frightening what's, what's happening in Russia, uh, because I don't know. The, um, Russia is sophisticated in lots of ways, but uh, everybody likes a whipping boy, right? Nothing unifies people more than a common enemy. And let's remember that in the 80s, when the Berlin Wall fell and communism fell apart, all of the religious conservative leaders in America got together in one place and said, now that we don't have the communists to use to raise money, who's gonna be the bad guy? 
and they chose homosexuals. That's why you see this stuff going on right now. So, um, so my guess is Putin has figured out that's a, that's a pretty safe enemy. It's a, a small group of people uh, to oppress, uh, and, you, and you win the support of the vast majority. It's, it's awful. It's awful. But I, again, I, w I wouldn't use the Olympics to, to do that. Although, if, if something happens to one of our athletes who either speaks on behalf of gay people, uh, which is against the law, or if action is taken against one of the gay athletes, then, you know, I'd go for the nuclear option. Not really. <laughs> Not really. Joke, joke, joke. I don't want to read that in the Washington Post tomorrow, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Or on your show tomorrow morning. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question that, that I haven't heard anybody respond to. What percentage of people in the United States are gay or, or lesbian, do you think? Are yeah, um, uh, it's, it's probably somewhere between 2 and 5 percent. You know, the 10% number that we used for so many years uh, came out of all that flawed study of um, of Kinsey. Uh, yeah, well, in the late 40s, I think it was. Um, yeah, somewhere between 2 and 5%. Um, and, and depending on whether you're talking about gay or lesbian or bisexual. What's what do you base that on? Well, j just the research has gotten better and, and, and people now self-identify. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. so, so rather than uh, doing a lot of extrapolating from a small sample, we can just ask people now. Uh, although, although, I mean, the fact of the matter is, so here's where I think we're, we're moving. Um, I think we're moving to an understanding that there are as many sexualities, plural, as there are people. When you think of it, no two of us are alike. No two of us have had the same experiences. The very, you know, you get a bunch of, of straight men or uh, lesbians or whatever in a room, and the very thing that erotically turns on this one over here is the very thing that turns off somebody over here. I mean, we're just incredibly complex. And part of what I think is exciting is that we, we are beginning to acknowledge how complex an issue this is. And, and so we're, we're getting off this, this, again, Kenzie scale, you know, from, what was it, zero to five or one to seven or something like that. Um, and this kind of binary looking at things. I mean, it did say that there were some people in the middle, but I, th I think we're, we're talking about a big circle and we're each a dot in it. I mean, so um, uh, let, me, let me just say a little more about that because I think this is where our movement is, is going. So Kenzie told us we were either gay or straight, right? And, and so we, we were the straight community and the gay community. And then lesbians said, hello, hello, we're here, and our experience is different from gay men. So we became the straight community and the gay and lesbian community. And then bisexuals spoke up, and then transgender people, and then intersex people, and uh, I mean, we're running out of letters, right? L, B, G, uh, T, uh, Q for either queer or questioning, I for intersex, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I haven't checked the papers this morning. We may have claimed another letter um, <laughs> since then. But look at, over here is just one big glob of heterosexuality. Where is the diversity there? Like, what, what letters should we use for you? And, you know, you ought to, like, talk amongst yourselves and, and uh, get back to us about what letters we should use for you. Because there is at least as much diversity in the straight com uh, community as there is in the gay community. And that's what I'm saying. I, I think uh, we'll use these labels for a while, and then wouldn't it be nice if we can just be who we are? Uh, what, a, what a lovely concept that would be. So does anybody want to volunteer some information on that, on that side of the equation? We can start, <laughs> we can start putting letters on tonight. Mm -hmm. And 
everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I I wrote a piece for the uh, I think it was the Washington Post um, right after the Supreme Court uh, hearings uh, where we had these big wins you know for DOMA and so on. The day before, you'll remember the Supreme Court gutted the Voter Rights Act. So I wrote this piece saying that as overjoyed as LGBT people should be about our, our wins, we should be equally as concerned, uh, f particularly for African Americans and Latinos, about, about the Voter Rights Act. At the end of it, just as a, like a, a funny little metaphor, I said, it's hard to be funny in the paper because you know, like people take it all different kinds of ways. Uh, I said maybe we ought to add a, a a brown and black stripe to the rainbow flag. Oh my God! No one responded to, you know, the importance of the Voter Rights Act and working on behalf of our black and brown brothers and sisters. It was all about well, that would look stupid with a black black and brown stripe, and I'm like. Oh, I didn't mean that for crying out loud. Come on, give me a break here. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, if I can just uh, mention, you mentioned DOMA a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, the latest New Yorker, we all subscribe to the New Yorker, has a wonderful article about Edie Windsor, uh, who was the plaintiff, of course, in DOMA. The article is called The Perfect Wife. It's a whole story of her. Fantastic. Yeah. So. She is a force to be reckoned Boy, with. She is. Oh, my God. Your friend mm -hmm. from New Hampshire? Gene, would you tell the Jimmy Carter story, please? Oh, yeah. I don't tell that much publicly. <laughs> you, told uh, me, you told me I could. Uh, well, which I might as well have put it in the New York Times by <laughs> telling you. But. So um, uh, I went to the Green, the Green Belt Conference, uh, which is... Um, no, I'm sorry. This was the the Hey on Why uh, book festival thing. Um, it's on the Wye River, a little town just over the border into Wales. Uh, this is a, a eensy weensy little town, maybe 150 people large, and it's got like 20 used bookstores. I mean, it's like this uh, center for for books. It's amazing. So I'm invited to speak. Uh, it was when my first book came out. I'm staying in, in this Downton Abbey kind of house with Salman Rushdie, uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, I don't know, you know, like that. Like I'm just like, do they know who I am and why am I here? Um, so I, uh, the, the host says to me, oh yeah, and um, President Carter's coming over for drinks tonight. And I'm like, of course he is. It's like, <laughs> oh, and the night before, you know the, the naked chef, uh, Jamie yeah. Oliver? Yeah, so one of the women staying in this house um, had given Jamie Oliver his first job in a restaurant. So he helicoptered in to the back lawn and fix dinner for us. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, so of course Jimmy Carter was coming over for drinks. So he and Rosalind and uh, Amy came over and uh, I met them, it was lovely. And I thought I'd never see him again. And um, so I'm, I'm in their largest um, venue, it seated about 2,000 people, it was filling up for my presentation. And I see Jimmy Carter and Rosalind and Amy come in, sit in the front row. And I knew he had an event. His, his speaking event started uh, right after mine in, in another venue. During my speech, which was on homosexuality and the Bible and blah, 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 uh, they came to get him two or three times uh, to you know, get him ready for his, and he waved them off, stayed to the very end, and then went off. I thought I'd never see him again. The, uh, the uh, publisher of uh, The Guardian, which was the, like the corporate sponsor for this event, um, had a dinner. I thought there'd be, I don't know, 300 people there or something. Well, there were maybe 20 people, 22 people, something like that. 
Amy and Rosalind and President Carter were there. So we're chatting and that was lovely. So we had had our first course and we're between courses and the, this publisher said, well, we're, we're sort of uh, between courses here. Um, and I noticed that a number of you uh, went to each other's events today. And I, I thought maybe in this little break, it would be nice to hear what you thought of each other's uh, presentations. Uh, President Carter, I noticed that you were at Bishop Robinson's um, presentation today. Uh, and I wondered if you would just you know, tell us what you thought. I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> please take me away. Um, so he said, well, as most of you know, I still teach Sunday school in, in the Baptist church where I've always been, uh, about 40 Sundays a year. Uh, for my whole life, I have believed everything that, <coughs> that the um, Baptist church has taught about homosexuality. Uh, but I must say, all of my concerns uh, about that uh, were met uh, in Bishop Robinson's talk, and I find myself in a completely different place. Whoa. And I, so I said, I mean, what do you say, right? <laughs> Thank you. Just, <laughs> so I said, Jesus, take me now. My time here is over. <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, and he said, no, he said, um, uh, and, and in the second part, he, he just said, I, uh, I, I find myself in a completely different place, and, and I intend to do something about that. And, and he had a tear rolling down his cheek. Oh. Really oh. amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and he has, if you've seen any of his uh, latest writing. It's just astounding. You've got to get those Baptists one at a time. I, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're tough. Yes. Uh, Thank you. I, this is way more entertaining than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a serious question. Okay. I mean, based what, do you think I've not been serious before? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. In terms of, well, from, based on what you've been saying, a theme has been running through my mind that perhaps, um, unlike it, with the civil rights movement, where religion in the religious community was so much a part of what made the civil rights movement, it occurs to me that religion has been the obstacle in terms of homophobia. I just around the world, it's just absolutely. A, yeah. So what do we do about that? Yeah. Um, question. And so here, and here's one of the reasons, is that uh, for other issues that face us, be it uh, the environmental movement or racism or whatever. Uh, you, you kind of have to extrapolate from scripture, right? You have to say, you know, well, here's this, and so it would mean that. But with this particular issue, I mean, when you've got a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, it just seems pretty straightforward, right? If you don't look at the context or whatever. And so it, I mean, and, and you'll see people on the other side say, well, it, you know, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, like, read it. Just plainly read it. Well, the fact of the matter is, you can't plainly read scripture. That is, that is just not possible. Um, so, I th so I think that's the reason. And, and I think that um, uh, I, I have said for the last 30 years that, that, that religion is the greatest obstacle. And, and what I say to LGBT groups is, uh, you'd better be interested in religion. Even if, even if you don't want any kind of community of faith for yourself, if you want this movement to succeed, you have to pay attention to this stuff. Because even, I mean, we even get completely non-religious people in legislatures across the country quoting scripture uh, against us, right? And so, um, so it's, it's a part of the argument, and it's a part of the movement, whether we like it or not. Um, and, and so, uh, and here's where the fear comes in. For people who, who believe that God wrote those words, you know, just dictated them, um, I think the fear is that if, if they come to a different understanding about those particular portions of scripture, then the whole thing falls apart, mm -hmm. right? And, and the fact of the matter is, it doesn't. It doesn't, because uh, when, you, when you do context, it, it gives you a, a key to unlock the scriptures. 
to to use our God-given intelligence to decide what is culturally bound and what is eternally binding, right? And, and we can do that. Now, no one of us can do that because our, our ability to um, uh, be self-serving and to see what we want to see uh, is too great you know, for one person, but we, which is why we need a religious community together to say, is, is this culturally bad? And, and, we, and, the, and the, the crazy part is, of course, uh, even the fundamentalists do this, right? Uh, first of all, they don't uh, hold all of Scripture to have equal weight, or else you would see, you know, the Jerry Falwells and, and Pat Robertsons of the world quoting the Gospel of Luke, which quotes Jesus as saying, "If you want to be a follower of mine, you must give up all your possessions." <laughs> Funny, never heard them talk about that <laughs> as being the words of God. You mean both planes? Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. And uh, so, so um, and, 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 and so we have tools to, to discover um, uh, which are, are, are um, uh, forever binding. I don't think anyone would question loving your neighbor and loving, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself is eternally binding. Eating shellfish? I don't know, it just seems negotiable. Right, so uh, uh, but but I think that's that's where the fear uh, the fears. The other thing is um, I, I've talked to a number of my very conservative colleagues from very conservative parts of the country, uh, other bishops, and I said to them, "What what do you what do you think people's fear is?" He said, "My people um, look at someone like Jack Spong, who is really well regarded by people who who have left the church." but not terribly well regarded by people who are still in the church. He said, my people look at Jack Spong, who started out as this astounding, and I mean really astounding, advocate for LGBT people at a time when it was not popular, and has moved on to um, sort of toss out you know the 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 virgin birth, the resurrection, the all these all these things that are important, and and they think the the LGBT issue is the the camel's nose under the tent, huh. and if yeah. they give in on this one, then everything else that they hold sacred will be uh, in jeopardy. So when I'm speaking to really conservative groups, which I'm getting more and more um, invitations to do, um, I. Um, I try to emphasize my conservative credentials. I mean, I'm actually theologically really conservative. Uh, and I don't play fast and loose either with scripture or with, with uh, doctrine. Uh, but most of them think I'm just the opposite. So I, I try to uh, reassure them that uh, just, just because we, we look at these portions of scripture doesn't mean the whole thing's gonna get thrown out the window. Well, Bishop, I want to pick up on uh, what this gentleman said. It has certainly been entertaining, uh, but also informative and inspirational. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.